All right, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is the Efficiency Cities Network call being presented with a host of other organizations. We'll get going in just a minute, uh, but are giving everybody a chance to call in still. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are just calling in, we'll be starting in just a minute. All right, hi everybody, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome to this joint American Rivers, Mayor's Innovation Project, Water Environment Research Foundation, and Efficiency Cities Network call. We got a, a nonprofit super team for you here today. Uh, on the topic of integrated water management, this is the first of a three-part series, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, currently speaking, I'm James Irwin, the longtime coordinator of the Efficiency Cities Network. I'm also associate director of the Mayor's Innovation Project, and uh, we're thrilled you're able to be here with us. For those of you who are new to our calls, the Efficiency Cities Network exists to share good ideas for cities, how to make them work more efficiently and effectively, focusing traditionally on energy efficiency, but with interests that exceed uh, that scope. We have hosted an ongoing series of conversations about these topics, and we have past recordings um, of the discussions that we've had on our website. You can access them at efficiencycities.org, where you can also sign up for notification about future calls, including the next uh, editions of this series. I'm gonna be turning over moderation duties to Gary at American Rivers in just a second, but first a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this call is being recorded. Your lines are currently muted. Um, though if you have questions throughout, you are welcome to send them along via the question box at any time. You should see that on your interface. Um, we'll sort through them and ask them at the end. Uh, but even better and far more interesting is if you raise your hand, uh, and that way we'll know that you actually would like to speak to our presenters today. You can raise your hand at any time, and at the end of the presentations, we'll come through and unmute you. Uh, so you're able to ask your questions directly. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Gary, who is a longtime friend of us here at the Mayor's Innovation Project, and he is the Senior Director of Clean Water Supply at American Rivers. Thanks, James. Can you can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. All right. Well, well thank you and welcome, everybody, to this uh, introduction to integrated water management for cities. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to thank the Mayor's Innovation Project, Efficiency Cities Net Network, and Water Environment Research Foundation for, for co-sponsoring with us. Um, we've been working with uh, all these partners for quite some time, um, and as James has said, uh, we see the Mayor's Innovation Project and Water Environment Research Foundation, Efficiency Cities Network, as, as great partners on this uh, subject uh, for some time. and. Um, and this is an important emerging subject, and that's why I'm so excited to, to be able to do this introduction with them and, and help frame the subject out a little bit. Um, just a little bit of a background. Uh, American Rivers is a national NGO, and our, our core mission is to protect wild rivers, restore damaged rivers, and conserve clean water for people and nature. And core to accomplishing this mission is how water is managed, and particularly how it is drawn from and re-enters rivers. Uh, and for this this subject, water is an essential element, and it's an essential element to our lives. Um, but population growth and climate change are forcing us to reevaluate how we manage water and uh, to maintain sustainable access to clean water. In 2010, the percentage of the U.S. population living in cities or suburbs surpassed 80 percent, and unfortunately we are not updating our, our infrastructure at a fast enough rate to support this growth. Additionally, this growth is putting increasing strain on river basins, particularly in the face of climate change um, stressors like drought and floods. 
A healthy, naturally functioning river system is the best asset for the cities that depend on them. And by extension, cities are an integral component in any river basin um, and have a significant impact on both the river and the other cities within the basin that share the river as a resource, and as such are, are a critical component to solving the challenges um, that we face um, uh, in the water sector. So this is where integrated water management comes in. Uh, Teresa and George will go more in depth on definitions and how integrated water management is applied. Uh, but the key is that it is a concept that pushes us to look beyond current silos for solutions. Uh, whether uh, it is increasing communication or in coordination within departments, agencies, and cities, or, or goes further into the development of management plans or other tools, looking to cut across different sectors is, is critical. Essentially, we all have impacts on water and as an extension on the river. Departments of transportation, parks departments, stormwater, wastewater, drinking water, the list goes on. And so in order to solve the challenges facing us, we have to get out of our comfort zones and look to work across different sectors in an intentional and regular and integrated way so that we can ensure that both the rivers and our communities are able to thrive. So to help us kind of take a, a first look at this, um, uh, I would really like to welcome uh, Teresa Connors and, and George Hawkins, who are our featured speakers. Um, just a little bit about our speakers. Uh, Teresa uh, is a... Um, a uh, professional engineer and has been a leader in integrated water management um, for cities since managing Sarasota County, Florida's water utility for 13 years, where she served as the water resources general manager and utility director managing the water, wastewater, reclaimed water, stormwater, and solid waste utilities and natural resources program. Um, at the Water Research uh, Environment Research Foundation, she managed the stormwater and decentralized systems um, challenge areas and the sustainable integrated water management challenge that includes looking at institutional issues to green, gray infrastructure, land use plan considerations, and others. Um, she has currently or recently joined Colorado State University's One Water Solutions Institute, where she is continuing to, uh, to push forward these solutions. Um, and I, at the same time, I'll also introduce George. Uh, George Hawkins serves as the Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of the District of Columbia Water Sewer Authority, uh, DC Water. and um, with an operating capital budget of nearly $1 billion, DC Water provides drinking water delivery and wastewater collection and treatment for a population of more than 600,000 in the District of Columbia, as well as millions of people who work in or visit the District of Columbia, uh, actually including me, and I'm sitting here drinking a, a glass of uh, uh, George's uh, work right now. Um, and uh, the... Um, DC Water also treats wastewater for a population of 1.6 million in Montgomery and Prince George's counties in Maryland and Fairfax and Loudoun counties. And um, they operate the world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plant at Blue Plains with a capacity of 370 million gallons per day and a peak daily capacity of more than a billion gallons. Um, and I'll just say one of my favorite quotes from George is, uh, when asked once how many jobs does DC Water provide, um, because that's a big question everybody gets asked, his response was classic, it was all of them. Because, uh, and I just thought this summed up the importance of water in general because every job uh, in, in these cities, um, whether it actually relies on water directly or operates otherwise, it's, it relies on access to water and it needs to dispose of its water somehow and somehow. So with that introduction, um, Teresa, I believe will be uh, speaking first and I'll, I'll turn over the microphone to her. All right, thanks, Gary. Nice introductions. Um, as Gary mentioned, my name is Teresa Connor. I am with the One Water Solutions Institute at Colorado State University, and I will be wearing two hats here today, also with the Water Environment Research Foundation. And really, the basis of um, my presentation today is really considering our current challenges or crisis. And there's an old Chinese saying that says crisis has two meanings, danger, or, and or opportunity, and it can mean both at the same time. And the question is, can we use the existing challenges our water industry faces, that Gary mentioned, as an opportunity to improve city livability? And that's kind of a conversation that's going on in the water industry right now as it goes through a transition. And I want to take just a moment or two to go through how the water industry in the United States has developed over time. Because for me to look at where we're going, it's always helpful to know where we've been. 
And this is um, based on some work done out of Australia by Rebecca Brown. I'm going to, during the discussion, kind of modify it to the U.S. But it's really looking at how the water industry has developed, which started really as a water supply uh, program. And that really started in the U.S. with Philadelphia when they established the first uh, water works in 1804 in which they replaced their wooden water pipes that before that time had their main function was um, fire suppression or fire protection for the community because in the colonial days really the role of water in the community was to put out fires from the gas lanterns across the thatch roofs and others. So in 1804, Philadelphia decided to start their water supply and provide cast iron pipes and bring high quality water into the city. And so, you know, we really started to see uh, the water industry develop after that. And if you fast forward 50 years, the water industry or the cities across the US, Europe, England, Australia faced crisis with the plague and the need for sewer systems was quickly identified as the need for sanitation services in the cities um, was des desperately needed for health protection and sewage schemes developed in which uh, pipes were laid in the city to take the wastewater out to what was considered a benign environment. And if you consider the water supply in the sewer system that developed in the early 1800s, that really is the backbone for the U.S. cities in the urban areas really to be able to provide the dense uh, populations and industry that happens, which is the backbone of the economy for the U.S. So these two uh, technology developments in the early 1800s is critical to us today. And although these did develop, the next phase of um, transition that's really identified is the drain city. And this in the U.S. has kind of two um, periods of time when it was developed. In the 1920s, some drainage systems started to develop for ag, so they could make the land more um, arable and grow more food on it. And then in the 1950s, drainage systems really developed to support suburban development uh, for the cities as they grew out, and also agriculture, and really provided um, economic development opportunities for both cities and ag as land was drained and the water was once again taken off to what was considered benign environments. But in the, and through all of this, the kind of relationship between the utilities or the water service providers and the community was just the way to provide services the cheapest. There was not it's not really much environmental protection at this time, and it was really focused on cost. But what we found in the 1960s, and finally in 1972, was creation of the Clean Water Act, was another progression or transition for the water industry as environmental protection and social amenity was considered. And really we developed into waterway cities where the water industry was focused on point and non-point source management. And we still really have many communities operating in this way today, where not only cost has to be considered, but environmental protection. And this is kind of creates the social um, framework for how utilities are dealing with or interacting with their community. They have to balance uh, economic needs with environmental considerations. And so, you know, there, that was, you know, rather new. Um, to many utilities at the time. The next phase of transition that the water industry is going through, and this isn't happening everywhere, and it hasn't been all at once, but it's the limitation on natural resources. And whether that's supply or whether that's um, water quality considerations, the, the need to diversify um, and consider fit for purpose water sources, conservation, and greater protection of waterway systems really plays into even a more complex conversation with our communities on how do we provide water? How do we live within our urban areas and interact with the cities? And so um, this happened where I came from in Florida. Um, 
somewhat in the 90s as they went through an extreme drought, but it's not happening in all communities. And when we consider what's the ultimate transition that the water industry could make to really be sustainable, there's a concept of a water sensitive city that Rebecca Brown and her colleagues put out there as really having adaptive multifunctional infrastructure and incorporating urban design features that reinforce water sensitive behaviors within the community and really is what's needed for to deal with the climate change issues that we're facing today. So that's just um, kind of a quick overview of how the water industry transitions um, for providing services to the community. And so this concept of a water sensitive city isn't defined um, everywhere and it's really leading to a discussion of an urban water charter. And what's on the screen now is a kind of a draft from the International Water Association of a potential urban water charter. And the reason I like this graphic is because it shows the water services, regenerative water services, where we're, we're um, reducing consumption, we're reusing water, recovering energy and nutrients, and replenishing the surrounding environment within an, a water sensitive urban design that has a plan for water sensitive urban spaces, looks to reduce flood and drought risks, and enhance the value of, and the presence of water in the city, and really take the opportunity to improve livability and bring ecosystem services into the city. And recognizing that it has to be within a water-wise community where citizens are involved, there's code benefits identified, there's interdisciplinary teams working, and really the governance works and coordinates at four scales, which includes uh, the building, the neighborhood, the city, and the watershed scale. So that is, um, that is one kind of way to look at how can the water industry evolve to that water sensitive city. And in one of the critical challenges identified is the institutional issues. The fact that our governance system is so fractured and, and the delivery is so fractured. So with that, WERF, the Water Environment Research Foundation, along with the Water Research Foundation and Water Research Australia, completed a study that's now available on um, the WERF website, www.werf.org, to really look at how do we address these um, institutional issues. And in that study, one water is identified as um, where the urban water cycle is considered a single integrated system. And you have regenerative infrastructure that looks at water within the city as a resource, including wastewater, stormwater, which now can be considered disposal issues. And it really starts to break up that um, pipe water in, use it once, pipe it out, treat it, and dispose of it, to really recognizing that water in our urban area is a resource and we need to consider it a catchment and the water system as a catchment for water, energy, and nutrients. And it happens at many scales. And what it seeks to do is really bring water back into the city, which will also bring nature back into the city. So in looking at whether you're addressing green infrastructure or energy or you know any of the programs that can be considered under integrated water or one water systems, what the study found is there's really six key elements to transitioning um, to a one water paradigm shift within the institutions. And one of the most critical is strong leadership and vision from senior positions at both uh, political and executive levels. There's partnerships between departments and collaborating organizations. There's an organizational culture that embraces the one water approach. Transparent engagement with the community and stakeholders, a, con a conducive economic environment for private investment, and a conducive regulatory and legislative environment for encouraging public and private con participation. So just to touch for this group on the bold leadership because, you know, and it is bold leadership that is needed, political leadership is needed to develop an inclusive vision of urban environment. And I just noticed a typo, it should be and and not and. But some of the lessons learned are as the need for establishing mutually beneficial goals and actions and creating regional leadership 
task committees, encouraging community participation and support, and reaching a common understanding with stakeholders. An interesting thing on leadership is a study out of Australia that showed, you know, what are the different leadership elements needed? And the top three here, the champion leader, enabling leader, and strategic leader, are really within the senior leadership or elected positions. But we need leadership at all levels. And the identification of cross-boundary team leaders um, throughout the organization was noticed in Australia. And also the need for outside leadership outside of the organization, either thought leaders or trusted advisors. And so, you know, leadership is critical um, for, you know, really getting these systems off the ground and to be sustainable. Other transitions that were identified as being needed within the study, under planning and collaboration, the need to tackle silos, politics, and short-term inflexible processes, Within the culture of organization, you know, really requires changing mindset at all levels, and that really requires freeing up staff time to collaborate across boundaries. And one of the most important is with the citizen and stakeholder engagement, um, getting community support requires trust. And I had a human resources person always tell me that any change initiative will move at the speed of trust. So really having the community trust the water sector as the people who are there to solve these problems is critical. Um, also on the economic and um, finance, the need to move beyond traditional cost-benefit analysis to more how do we provide value to the community. And with regulations and legislation, um, tackling inconsistent and overlapping regulations or providing a framework where no regulatory framework exists. So that's some of the things identified in the WERF study as what's needed to help organizations move on. I want to touch real quick on something going on at CSU along with WERF, which is the Urban Waters Innovation Network, or UN. And in that, um, this really uh, seeks to connect linkages between the urban water systems, the social and political systems, and the linked urban water systems such as heat island energy and biodiversity. And it'll be interesting with funding set up for utility systems that really focuses on service provision, how cities can interact to bring on these other uh, considerations with climate and heat island it may not fit under the funding current funding protocols of utilities, but is a concern of the city. So um, these discussions are badly needed. And one of the things that really I'll focus on is the transitions. Um, the, on the left side of this slide is pressures and all the challenges that we know about aging infrastructure, diminishing resources, climate change. And on the right side is resilience and co-benefits. And it kind of it goes from high to low of the thing. But if we continue along our path in our siloed and fractured way, we may not get resilience and much resilience or co-benefits from our investment, but if we can make transitions to really bring together systems, um, you know, we can get resilience, co-benefits, and livability for the cities and its residents. So looking at that transitions is critical. Um, the research plan has four thrusts that are not linear but interconnected, where they assess baselines identify technology solutions, identify institutions and in the transitions needed, and assess the effects and trade-offs of these programs. And so the ultimate outcome is an urban water blueprint that looks at what are the essential characteristics and the data behind it, helps decision makers get best practices, shares experiences, and stays agile. And within that, the, this study as it starts will be focused on uh, six regions around the U.S. that um, where there's long-term data collection for NSF, who is funding the study. But as we get started and as we progress, we'd love to bring more cities into this and be able to really um, grow the network so there's more learning going on and look for any feedback on how to do that. And just welcome to my um, email address is right there on the screen right now, Teresa.Connor at calustate.edu. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Gary so he can um, turn it over to George. All right, thank you. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> thank you so much, Teresa. And uh, 
it's always very enlightening to see one of your presentations. There's so much thought uh, put into this, and uh, it's uh, really fascinating the work that you're doing. Um, so, uh, James, uh, do we just then go ahead and uh, and uh, move it on over to George? Let's do that. Hello, this is uh, George Hawkins. Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, uh, delighted to be with you all uh, today, and I was fascinated. I've known Gary for years, and Teresa, I know of your work, and was fascinated by your presentation. And uh, I think it was right on. There's a lot in there that I learned. Um, this is the first slide in my presentation, and, and I actually hadn't thought to spend a time here, but it's worth stopping for a moment. What you see on the screen is a uh, aerial photo of Blue Plains. This is our treatment facility. It's the largest of its kind uh, in the world, and you get a sense of its scale. Um, 295 in the size of a, a vehicle you see on the right side of the screen. Um, looking uh, to the top of the screen, you have um, the first phase of, of wastewater treatment. Um, uh, secondary is essentially on the upper right-hand side. Almost all of those treatment cells to the middle right is tertiary treatment. And uh, what we just finished at almost $900 million is additional nutrient removal, which is the bottom right corner. Almost directly in the middle of the screen, uh, you're looking at a, a part that I'll come back to in this presentation, which is our almost $500 million project to take the biosolids we're generating at the site, turn it into power, and a clean nutrient-based uh, fertilizer amendment. And that's the four, you see the four huge digesters. Each one of those is 130 feet wide, which is a 13-story building, and 80 feet tall. They're, they're huge. Um, going to the left of the screen, in the upper left, you see two excavations that are circular going into the ground. That's a multi-billion dollar project that is uh, taking overflow that otherwise would go to the river in a rain event um, and channeling it through very large tunnels uh, to this facility. In total, uh, what our rate payers are looking at, whether retail in the district or wholesale customers in the suburbs that surround us, are billions of dollars of cost. And what the reality is for all of us who are working at the level of delivering these services in cities or suburbs or rural areas, anywhere in the United States, is these are costs being borne directly by our ratepayers. And on that fascinating chart that Teresa started with showing the evolution of our of what cities are in providing these services, essentially we are all of the ones before and hope to move to the right. So we haven't stopped being a sewer service delivery agency while we had water, or started with water, then added sewer, then storm water, and then into more integrated approaches. All of those other elements are still part uh, of the workload. And honestly, what drove DC water uh, directly in this, um, into this approach, and uh, I'll talk more about as a practical matter what we've been doing, essentially in the three categories that Teresa was talking about, one in how we integrate and communicate with our customers, second is how we're delivering the service itself, uh, and third is how we're looking at um, regeneration uh, on the waterfront. All of this has been in total a package to present a compelling case of the value of our services to our ratepayers. Because ultimately, any of these projects or any of the approaches that we seek, no matter how well integrated we are, no matter how well we communicate, leadership, rely on having a value proposition that we can present to our ratepayers that they're willing to fund. Um, so without that uh, fundamental step, nothing else happens. Um, I'm actually not sure how I'm supposed to advance the slides. In it. Oh, there it goes. Um, oh, I advanced it one too many. Um, Okay, there you are. Um, this is a little bit about DC water. We do do drinking water for the city. Uh, it's called wastewater, although we call it enriched water uh, services for both Washington, D.C. and a very large sector of Maryland and Virginia, the suburbs that surround us. So it's a very large service area, and we handle stormwater, um, particularly in the combined sewer areas. Um, so we have a full water agenda uh, at DC Water. And you see on the left some of the uh, numbers of, of what we undertake. Our operating and capital budgets do exceed in combination over a billion dollars a year, um, which we um, is a, an enormous challenge uh, for us to take on. Um, the first category of integrated, or integrated water management, that, so what's the practical way that this unfolded at DC Water. And we're literally looking at it in four components. One is how we communicate and integrate with our customers, and that's a rebranding and public outreach. The second is how um, we're redesigning the work that we do. 
um, both in a manner that achieves multiple benefits, and this is green infrastructure, but also is communicating and connecting with our customers in a new way. And then the third is the regeneration notion of water, of how can we turn our facilities not just into a service we deliver, but re regenerating and revitalizing resources um, even as uh, we deliver and clean them in their use. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each, um, but I'm starting with the rebranding and public outreach. Uh, I started at DC Water, um, it's now uh, seven and a half years ago, uh, which is a long uh, half-life for a chief executive for a public agency in the district. Um, as Teresa well knows, these are not jobs for the faint of heart, and I'm sure everybody on the uh, on the uh, webinar agrees. The, we deliver direct services, but um, it's tough work, um, and we have to be prepared to be in front of the customers we serve every day with what we do well and what sometimes we don't do as well. Um, we decided to start with how we communicate with our customers, the rebranding and public outreach, and I believe fundamentally that this is perhaps, it's often called sort of the soft side, it's not heavy engineering or financial instruments or how we're going to rebuild or restructure, but it is the foundation upon which all the rest is um, built. If we do not have a relationship with our customer in a way uh, that presents a compelling case to them, we will never get the support, whether it's financial or operational, to do the kind of work that we seek to do uh, in this city or any other. So the and and in some good measure it's it it does cost money but relatively speaking it was not expensive compared to some of these other huge projects we've done is and it, and we've gained so much benefit from having an improved relationship with our customer base some of which is support for these big um innovative projects some of which is we just work better if we hear more from our customer get better feedback speedier feedback interact quickly in return, um, their whole sense of relationship and communication to what matters to them is much higher on our list and theirs and allows us um, ha to have this new relationship with the people we serve. Um, the old model um, at uh, DC Water, which, let's see, um, oh gosh, I, I didn't realize it was going to come out in pieces, um, is um, that as a re utility, uh, we reacted. Um, almost no one would know what we were doing until something happened. Um, we're hidden underground. Uh, it's really a remarkable story of the success of water utilities. Um, that most people in the United States get up and turn on the water on uh, in, in, and use it in the morning, or flush a toilet, or, or down the drain from a disposal or, or a washing machine, and don't spend even a moment thinking about where the water came from or how it got there or where it goes once it goes down the drain. And relative to human history, um, I believe it's the most important public health improvement that has ever been undertaken on behalf of our species or perhaps all the others, uh, the capacity to deliver drinking water that's clean every single day in a way that's so successful that people don't even think about it anymore. Because anywhere where it's not true, it's the most important issue in someone's day is where they're going to get water from. The disadvantage is most people don't think about it, including um, often our own relationship with the customer unless we're reacting to something, reacting to a water main break, reacting to a sewer backup, reacting to a flood, reacting to a drought. There's a reaction that we have and then the invisible becomes visible. And it's almost always in the context of something that's amiss and going wrong. Um, uh, because obviously it's underground for the most of it. Customers um, think about us only when something is wrong. Um, and I think we actually, and I, I took this as a, as a strong, as a strength, even if it had an unexpected outcome. That I talked to a lot of the veterans here at DC Water, and there was a, a matter of pride that people could rely on our services without thinking about it. That meant we were doing our job 99% of the time well because this incredibly important service was just there all the time so much so that people never thought about it. And tap water is run by municipal agencies. It's not very interesting or sexy, and it's also siloed. It's this isolated element that's um, and often in water or sewer, sort of off to the corner and not part of the uh, bigger systems that happen um, within a city. Um, DC Water knew we had to change uh, that whole perspective, both in how we operate and how our customers see us. So by rebranding and relogoing, it wasn't just about how we present ourselves. It's also how we respond and interact. So it was a behavior change on our part as much as it was, is also 
a manner in which we present ourselves uh, with a logo and, and all the rest. And um, it's been quite a fascinating experience uh, to undertake. Um, Water DC and the water drop, water's life. Um, you see it on the screen. Uh, DC was, Wasa was what we were known in the past. Um, I wear some of, if anyone on the call has seen me uh, give a presentation, I always wear a uniform every day, uh, like our line folks. And I've been wearing a uniform from when we had our old logo. And I always get humor out of the fact that someone walked up to me on the street in D.C. and said they wanted to work, uh, get a job from us. And I said, great, what are you interested in? And, and um, this uh, young fellow said, I'd love to work for the Department of Corrections. And it dawned on me that when you looked at our logo, you could not tell who we were. It, um, it had all sorts of, it was very red, white, and blue. There was, I think, the, the Washington Monument. There was all sorts of, it, it was a Washington, D.C. logo, without a doubt. But for what we did, it was almost impossible uh, to tell. And there was a two-sentence tagline that was, in any smaller version of it, you couldn't read. Um, and even if you did, you had to think about it for a while for what the heck it was trying to do. So we had a big contest with 180 entries from school kids and professionals and all the rest and ended up with what you see on the screen, which is DC and the water drop. We uh, commandeered uh, these colors. Uh, we've, it's really been part of us positioning ourselves as an environmental enterprise that is integrated into the daily lives of every business, every person in Washington, D.C. and the region, and that we want um, people to think of us that way, and we want ourselves to think of uh, of ourselves that way. Um, and um, uh, Gary mentioned at the outset, whenever people ask me how many jobs we support, I always say all of them. And whenever anyone asks us how many lives we support, I always say all of them. Because uh, water, without a water and wastewater service in your building, you will need to evacuate if it's commercial. Uh, you cannot get a certificate of occupancy without our services. Every living organism relies on water. NASA looks for water as uh, the first sign of life on another planet. Um, it's a remarkable um, privilege and uh, an amazing um, honor to do the work that we do. And it connects us to everything, which is a challenge but a great opportunity. So what? Um, we've been doing along with this relogoing is talking in every venue we can think of and interacting in every venue we can think of with our customers in, in all ways big and small. Um, we, all of our trucks are, have always been uh, painted white, but now we have uh, DC water. You can see there on the bottom left, one of our trucks, the, the logo leaps off the side uh, of the truck and it's very immediately identifiable. What I wanted was something like a Nike logo that once you, and it doesn't take long, DC in a drop. I bet you're a water company and I bet you're in DC. Well, as long as you can read, um, you have a sense of what that is. And if you can't read, you still know it's a water company. Um, and that's what we wanted. And now we get reports about our trucks being all over the city. Uh, well, our trucks were always all over the city. It's just nobody knew it was us. So now it's very clear that it's us. We advertise for our services and what we do uh, and their benefits on the side of our trucks. We have a whole drinking water campaign that we do on the side of our trucks. We do it on buses. Uh, we have our logo all over all over classes for drinking water, recyclable bottles, um, recyclable uh, water bottles. And we take DC water out to big hot events. DC is one of these cities that gets really hot in the summer. So we just wanna make ourselves visible. What you don't see um, on these pictures is uh, the number of town halls that we do, the number of community meetings we do. We have numerous full-time staff whose only job is to go out and engage in the community to make sure that whenever we're going to do a project, think we're gonna do a project, are doing a project, that from start to finish, from conception to completion, and thereafter, maintenance, that we're interacting with the community we serve. They know we're uh, taking their interests to heart and to account. Um, not everything goes as planned, so we communicate when things are amiss. Um, but it's just an entirely different relationship with a customer base. And I'm glad to say over seven years, where DC WASA, which was our same organization, just a different name, was considered one of the worst, if not the worst, customer-oriented um, enterprise, government enterprise in Washington, D.C. We're now usually in the top two or three as one of the best. And that's been part of a good, smart, fun logo, but it's been connected to the manner in which we behave and connect to our customers. And um, by the way, we also um, uh, do better work. 
people to see what we're doing, where we're doing it, and how we're doing it. So if there's anything, we get calls of this is, truck has been here too long. What are they doing here? And we're we're more transparent and accountable because everybody's watching us. I want everybody to watch us. No one's going to write a check out to us for the money we need to do the work if they don't see the work going on. So I want them to see us out there digging up things, working on because they know that's what I'm paying for. But it also means we have eyes and ears all over the city making sure that we're doing our work right and we get feedback constantly if we're not. And that only makes us better. So it's improved us on that whole na manner in which we connect. The second aspect, and again, this all goes back to the model, um, uh, several models that Teresa was talking about, is the water system design and being sensitive to water in the manner in which we do work. Um, the largest public works project that DC Water will ever undertake, other than the multi-decade uh, building of Blue Plains, but this is being done in a shorter period of time, and certainly in the modern era, and the largest public works project in Washington, D.C. since Metro was built, is our Clean Rivers Project, which is the challenge of overcoming uh, combined sewer overflow to the uh, Potomac River and its two uh, tributaries, Rock Creek and the Anacostia River. Um, like uh, the 755 cities in the United States that have combined sewer systems, um, again, as Teresa mentioned, it was after particularly cholera was connected um, to uh, sanitation or, or sewage being contaminated in drinking water in the 1850s that the Western world and much of the rest of the world following starts building sewers. And at the time, combined sewers, which put both stormwater and wastewater into the same pipe, was a much better design than what had come before. Now, the challenge is that one of these combined sewers, no matter how big they are, and some of these combined sewers that we have are 22 feet in interior diameter under the ground. They're huge. They're still not big enough in a big storm so that they fill, and when they fill the capacity, there's overflow of that mixture of, of, of sewage and rainwater going directly to our rivers. So we have a plan that is mandated by the court uh, to solve that problem, and it is a multi-billion dollar project. It's just an extraordinary scale. And it's also extraordinarily effective. Uh, we're seeking uh, to remove 96% of the overflow that in a measured year, you have to measure it to a particular year, would have gone to the river. Um, instead, is being treated and handled properly. Um, up through last year, that um, the remedy for that situation was uh, what, how, and I'm sure all of, most everyone on the call has heard that this is a gray solution which means we had giant underground tunnels where the overflows were being channeled into drop shafts. And when I say underground, <clears throat> the tunnels that we are building, and we are building a large portion of that gray um, solution, are t is 10 stories underground. So in that original picture of Blue Plains, where I showed you on the upper right corner, those two open uh, circular um, uh, uh, excavations, that is going down 10 stories uh, with a tunnel boring machine, which is 1,200 tons and longer than a, a football field, <clears throat> that's drilling up 13 miles up the Anacostia River to capture 98% of the overflow that would have gone to the river, is taken by these huge drop shafts, which drop it all the way down the 10 stories to this enormous underground tunnel, which conveys it all the way down to Blue Plains, where it can get treatment before going uh, to the Potomac River. Um, that is a good solution. It works well. Uh, the two, uh, at least two of the challenges are one is it's not flexible. So if you need more in the future as, uh, as climate change may cause greater and greater rain events, which certainly seems to be the trend in both directions, more drought and more flood, it might well mean that we need additional capture. And tunnels are so expensive and so big that it, you can't really do anything uh, in the short run, you're going to have to do another five to ten year project to build another big tunnel. So it, you, once you build it, it's very successful, but it's also static. It leaves you with a solution with a certain performance level where there's very little flexibility at the margin. And the second is, it's all underground and people don't see it. And so you're asking your customers to spend billions of dollars. I mean, the scale of these projects is breathtaking for a municipality and its ratepayers or taxpayers to take on for something that they don't see at all. There are 10 stories underground. Uh, we do take tours down to look at the tunnels while, we're being, while they're being 
built, but um, that will be few and far between once they're up and running. So like many cities, and uh, Teresa mentioned Philadelphia is the city, first city uh, with a, a modern sewer system, or uh, maybe it was maybe a modern drinking water system, um, but is um, Philadelphia is very big into this, and, and Portland, a lot of the cities in that study group uh, that she mentioned, is to use green infrastructure. If the question is how much stormwater is being channeled into these big pipes and conveyed, and the problem is, is that there's too much, so there's overflows, and the question is how you're going to handle it, then all sorts of other alternatives can come to play if what we need to do is manage stormwater before it gets to the pipe. Because if we can handle it on the ground before it gets to the pipe, then we don't have to have overflows. Or we don't have to build as big a tunnels because we've used it as a resource on the site rather than considering it a problem, channeling it and getting it out of the system um, as fast as possible. So we uh, worked with EPA, the Department of Environment, and the city uh, of Washington, D.C., Department of Justice, and have uh, succeeded in a proposal that modifies our consent decree and in the areas that you see that are green on the right side of these maps, um, we'll build about $100 million uh, of green infrastructure to capture rainwater before it would get into the sewer system, achieving the same result or goal for combined sewer overflows, but having so many other benefits um, to the city. Green infrastructure works all the time. The tunnel will only work when there's a big enough storm to cause an overflow. Green infrastructure will be capturing rainwater in every rainstorm. And that rainwater is clean on a water quality basis as well as storage. It will be supplying green growth, so trees and, sh and shrubbery that are very desirable for the neighborhoods that they're in, which has air quality benefits, it has heat island benefits. And very distinctly for us in our relationship to the customer, it's work that our customers will see at the scale of where they live. So that part of that money that they are writing out to us in the checks that they write as ratepayers, they're going to see work that directly improves the city streets of the city around them, connecting us once again to our customer and to their connection with our city. I hope it makes the city more desirable and brings all sorts of benefits um, as well. So this is a case in that evolution of uh, water authorities. And, and as Teresa aptly mentioned, Almost none of the green infrastructure that we will build, and perhaps even none, will be on land that DC Water owns and controls. So the, and most of the treatment we do are on pipes that we own, at treatment facilities that we own. It's within the footprint of our own work and our own property. This, by definition, means we're reaching out into the city for land that's mainly run by the city in the public space, some by the National Park Service on the federal level, and perhaps some on private land where this can be done. But you're automatically engaging with different agencies, with the Department of Transportation, with the federal government, with, with neighborhood groups. It requires all of that work that we did for our rebranding and our communication to be connected to now the engineering and operational aspect of DC Water in the agencies we deal with, the customers we deal with, the neighborhoods we deal with, and how we deliver on multiple benefits. So we're extremely excited about it. We think it's the right environmental outcome, but it also has the advantage of um, providing all the benefits of an integrated uh, response. Um, and I'm trying to advance the slide, but I'm not, if, if any of the moderators can move the slide forward, great. Um, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this slide um, because I've, almost everyone has seen it. It's just remarkable what a well-constructed um, green infrastructure can do, not only for stormwater. Most people will like it be, without knowing, unfortunately, what its consequences to stormwater. It makes uh, uh, the quality of life uh, at, at the street level, at the people level, so much better. And we hope that drives a lot of of economic activity um, in these neighborhoods uh, as well as just straight quality of life. If you go to the next slide, um, now this is where I stop, um, but it's that third level which is in part of integrated water management is reimagining DC water, not as we don't, and I always joke about this, but we're darn serious about it, and we've invested now $500 million in it of our ratepayers' money, which is we don't have wastewater, D.C. water. Uh, we have enriched water. Uh, our 
our little phrase internally is there's no there's no such thing as a waste only a wasted asset and the question is how we can we design our services to do the fundamental work which is remove contaminants and pollutants that are we don't want in our natural environment but also recycle replenish regenerate resources that can be reused as part of an entire notion of how a city can be sustainable. So what you see on the picture there can be in DC water. Um, this had never been used in North America nor anywhere in the world uh, at the scale that we have now built it and it is operating today right as we speak at DC water and, and in short um, this is our poop to power project um, to give you a sense of scale at DC water we have 60 tanker trucks a day of biosolids or the, what we're pulling out of the waste enriched water and don't want a sludge I mean it's, it's pretty uh, mucky stuff 60 tanker trucks every single day and by uh, doing worldwide research we worked with WERF quite a bit uh, on research uh, for this technology what you see is our canisters where this sludge at biosolid is heated up at high temperature and high pressure it comes out of those canisters into a flash tank where the change in temperature and pressure um, explodes the molecules so that means that the um, uh, that the little bugs in the digesters can do their work faster and more efficiently which generates methane a 13 megawatts of permanent clean power uh, at DC water um, and it also has the benefit of the resulting biosolid after the sterile heating has essentially been sterilized and now we have a biosolid which is super clean but still has organic nutrients in it. So while we haven't launched a, prod, a product yet, we are looking seriously at whether we can turn that into an organic fertilizer base, so it's not petroleum based, fertilizer or soil amendment that we can put on the market as much as we can also here generate power on site. Um, DC Water is the largest power user in Washington, DC. Our greatest fear uh, on a practical basis and resiliency in, in the extreme weather context is power. So our ability to generate this much power right at Blue Plains, which does not come off the grid and which is available to us as long as the Canby system itself hasn't been knocked out by some extreme event, gives us much more resilient uh, capability to keep core services running no matter what uh, the circumstances are around us. Um, and again, is it, all of these have been fascinating ways uh, to interact with our customers. So I will um, stop here other than to say <laughs> that the, coming back to where I started, which is this enormous uh, complex of, of obligations that we in the municipal level have to deliver services, it's old-fashioned sanitary lines, water lines, pumping lines, stormwater channelization, now more integrated and um, reusing and uh, resource regeneration design all of that still relies on a, a, an interaction with our customer we've been able to increase our water rates every year uh, to the point where they've doubled in the seven years I've been here that doesn't mean people are happy about uh, increased rates but we have gotten the support necessary to do the work that has allowed us to transform um, and I think that is, is enabled us to continue on this route uh, that the Mayor's Innovation Project is highlighting. Um, delightful to be here with uh, in part of the Inefficiency Cities, Cities Network and American Rivers and, the, and WERF. Teresa and Gary, thanks so much, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, that concludes my presentation. All right, thank you so much, George. And it's always fascinating to hear you talk about all the different things that you are working on. There's truly a lot of uh, innovation at DC Water, and I think one of the things that exemplifies sort of integrated water management and one water aspects to your work is all the different uh, ways that um, uh, that DC Water is looking to I integrate into what the city does. Um, the digesters is a perfect example of that. Um, four questions. We have a couple that have been written in. Um, if you want to answer, uh, ask a, uh, uh, a verbal question, uh, please utilize the hand raising um, function on your uh, on your screens, uh, and I will uh, take you off mute so you can ask a question. Um, while people are doing that, um, I uh, one simple question, uh, James, for you: uh, Will slides be available to folks? And how, uh, if so, how can we make that happen? Uh, with the presenter's consent, I can post those on the Efficiency Cities uh, website. Um, we can also include a link in the follow-up email from this call. All right. Thanks very much. Fine by me. Um, 
So the, the first question I have here uh, is uh, is for George. Um, somebody was asking if you have hard numbers comparing the cost benefits of gray versus green infrastructure and in the work that you've done with DC Water so far. Uh, we don't have hard numbers in the sense that we haven't built the green infrastructure yet. Uh, many people ask that question because some have engaged green infrastructure because it's less expensive. That has not been true for us. We're looking uh, with our modified consent decree where we're using gray and green at about the same total cost. Uh, we did get a five-year extension to do the green infrastructure because it actually takes a long time to do work in the street. There's only so many streets you can work on in a busy city until the city can't function anymore. Um, so we got a few extra years to do the work, uh, but it's about the same cost. But to, all, but to us, it was still far more optimal because of the manner in which the green connects with our customers in a different way and has these multiple benefits. I didn't even mention the job creation element of it, which is perhaps one of the most important. Uh, other cities have seen that it's expensive to do green for gray. That has not been our experience. Uh, but we still think uh, for all the other benefits that it's desirable. Thanks, Troy. Um, I have a couple other popping up on the uh, through uh, the text boxes. Uh, again, if you have any verbal questions you want to ask, go ahead and uh, click the uh, hand raise function, and I'll go ahead and, and ask those uh, in order. Um, another question I have uh, for Teresa, and then maybe George, is um, what you know more basic. Uh, you know, leadership is a, an important aspect of, uh, as Teresa said in her presentation of this. Is that where you want to start, or for a city who's trying to start out uh, implementing integrated water management techniques or one water, where's the best place to start? Well, I guess from my perspective, this is Teresa, um, having been in local government, I call integrated water or one water management the art of the doable. So it's kind of where do you want to do something? Where is there energy to do something, whether it's green infrastructure, whether it's um, stormwater and parks and rec working together, it's creating positive experiences of working together and the capacity to work across boundaries. And so it kind of varies for each city of what are their needs, um, what do they need to do. You know, uh, landscaping ordinances can be great because it can impact both the stormwater and the water conservation programs positively. But, um, you know, for me, it's kind of where where's the lowest hanging fruit and where do they feel like there's partnerships to get started? It's not a very concrete answer. Yeah, I, I agree with what Teresa said and I, I love the idea of the doable. Um, and my, I, I absolutely believe that most things happen because there's a champion um, who's taking the lead at, at driving something forward even as that person integrates out uh, across all sorts of other places and brings new uh, folks in who is the champion in the lead. In most cities that I've seen where this has taken off, there is a champion with enough capability, not capability as in a personal level, but capability as in an organizational level to move things forward. That certainly is important. The second is I, li I like Teresa's notion that uh, the great advantage of many of these projects is they are visible, that people like to see them. I, f I find that people are remarkably quick at making a connection to projects connected to water. And they have lots of people who can come and, and see, touch, feel when you put in a, a, an element of green infrastructure, including political leadership who may have done a small project before lots of dollars are, but see the benefit of being in a neighborhood doing something so positive, perhaps with people who were able to get a job by doing this work that otherwise wouldn't have had it. The number of, of small wins that you can get right out the bat and then slowly build up momentum to the point you're not going to start with a $500 million uh, digester project. You'll start with something smaller, show it works, show the benefits, gain allies, and then move ever farther outwards um, would be my suggestion. You know, and what's interesting on that, when you look at um, a number of communities of how did they get started, say, in the integrated water, it actually started with rain barrels. Um, you know, San Francisco's big on-site water program where they have a very big program to administer on-site systems, they started with rain barrels. So many infrastructure, and it's just getting your community involved in water in which they're managing it, they get involved. And um, getting that connection is important, as George said. 
Yeah, and, and actually, just to highlight, I see one of uh, our partner cities, uh, some folks from the city of Toledo uh, are, are on this, and just uh, they started with a rain garden initiative project, which really started to, to snowball and, and use that as an entry point. So things like that can really be useful. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of technical questions, um, but I want to I want to uh, engage the the ones that are um, more about uh, integrated water, and, and if we have the time, we'll come back to the technical questions. Um, uh, one on thoughts on engaging upstream stakeholders that operate outside your jurisdiction, um, but whose actions might amplify your risks, such as water stress or flooding. How to do that? How to get that conversation started? Yeah, how to how to do the engagement? Yeah. And and George, I don't know if you have some uh, experience with that with some of the other uh, jurisdictions uh, outside of yours that you've engaged in, or Teresa, something you might have seen. And in, in we we particularly are very good in the Washington. I claim no credit for this. This has been from before my time. But on on particularly drinking water source, so on on water supply, there is a network. All of us are almost all the communities around Washington D.C. draw off the Potomac River. And we have created a compact of all those various entities that are closely monitoring the supplies. There's been joint uh, funding of upstream reservoirs that can be released from if supplies are needed. So I've actually been very impressed with the regional effort on the drinking water side. It doesn't mean it's perfect. In a severe drought, all the good plans that you make will be stressed. But there's been very good preparation on the drinking water side. The, the bigger challenge, I think, is the, uh, on the pollutant side. Uh, most of the effort and focus across the country, not just in D.C., has been on the point source publicly owned treatment works where most of the money is being spent. And it, we are very conscious at D.C. Water that, of course, we do our part. Doing environmental work is, is a high order to us. But most of the pollutants going into the Chesapeake Bay are no longer coming from us. They're coming from runoff of farm fields and, and uh, from communities north of us. And uh, we do everything we can to interact with Maryland and Virginia and the Chesapeake Bay program on that front. But it is one of the tougher uh, nuts to crack about how to, how, to, how to handle those upstream sources as well as we have handled the urban uh, point sources. And I've always found it um, either, well, in some areas, if there's a regional planning council or something else that looks at the regional area going through that, and sometimes it might be if you have a tough topic to address with another jurisdiction, trying to find something you share or commonalities you share that you can work on so that, you know, you can go in with uh, finding commonalities, finding what you share, and figuring out how to get at that tough, um, tough topic from maybe a more, but we share this, and identifying shared objectives. Because um, it is kind of hard when something's outside your jurisdiction and it's negatively impacting you to create that change without um, more formal um, formal uh, kind of framework to address it like TMDLs or other things. All right. Thanks. Uh, James, do, do we need to close up shop or is there time to take some of these uh, technical questions? Uh, Thank you. I'll refer that to our presenters. Yeah, Gary, it's interesting for the, those on still on the call. We're, uh, we're doing a program, a press event in 30 minutes that I've got to get to with the American Society of Civil Engineers for the report card for our infrastructure in D.C. It's a very mixed message, um, I suppose, because after all these years of investment, reinvestment recently, we're now up to a C plus which I suppose is better than the D that they typically give out um, for infrastructure generally. but. Uh, on the other hand, it's nowhere near um, where you'd want to be for something as essential as water. But I do have to run, so I've really been delighted. Uh, everybody, I'm uh, glad to participate in the call. The, these programs are fantastic. The Efficiency Cities Network and Mayor's Innovations, American Rivers, awesome work. Glad to be part of it, but I do have to run. All right. Thanks again so much, George. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, so a couple of the uh, – so somebody had a uh, – there are a couple technical questions, and most of them were aimed at George, so I apologize that we weren't able to accommodate those. Um, uh, real quick, there's one on low impact development. Um, are there any? Are we aware of any efforts that these are being done um, as part of land development regulations? Um, so I'm going to assumption uh, that this is referring to being in codes and ordinances. Um, mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and real quick, I, I think there are some efforts to do that. It, it vary uh, regionally, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Teresa, I don't know if you know of any specific examples to that. Well, there are, and it's quite distributed around the country. Um, for example, where I was at in Sarasota County, we did write an LID manual and had it incorporated as voluntary within the um, land development regulations. And it's really um, county by county or municipality by municipality with their regulations. Um, you know, right now, city and county of Denver is working on an ultra urban LID manual. And one of the things I did want to mention, you know, that EPA will be working a lot on um, green and gray stormwater infrastructure and the life cycle costs and uh, different manuals. So um, hopefully in the upcoming year, there's going to be quite a bit of work coming up out of EPA on that that we can connect into. So um, I would say stay tuned for more information on that. But there are examples. I can send you a couple, Gary, that you can send on of where LID is incorporated into the land development regulations. All right. Uh, excellent. Um, we'll be, uh, James, we can work it out to have that in the same uh, site where we'll have the slides. Uh, Certainly. And those will be posted along with the recording of today's presentation at efficiencycities.org. All right. Um, uh, so, and, and I think we'll one one last question. I apologies to those whose questions we weren't able to get to. Um, but one last one is: it, Is there be a certificate of attendance, James, for this? Uh, we are not an organization that is accredited to provide anything like that. I'm sorry. All right. So. Um, I'm happy to say that you are here. If you want to send me an email. <laughs> so. All right, um, so with that, it's uh, 2.07. I'm sorry we've gone a little over time, but I want to thank uh, our partner organizations for, um, and particularly the Mayor's Innovation Project for setting all of this up and, and doing a lot of the groundwork. And, um, and also thank our, our speakers, Teresa and, and George, um, uh, for this work uh, and everything they've done on it. Fantastic presentations. Uh, and ask everybody to tune in to the, uh, the second and third webinars, which will be... Um, James will be sending out an email on timing. Actually, James, you want to mention what the dates are for those real quick? Uh, we have not actually finally confirmed them yet, but stay tuned. I will let you know that uh, on a non-water topic, our efficiency year in review call uh, will be coming up on January 26th at 2.30 Eastern. More details at efficiencycities.org. That's, that's where you can also get uh, confirmation of upcoming calls. All right. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, thanks for attending our, uh, our introduction to integrated water management. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.